Hi, glad to see you on your channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. It's important to us. Have a good view. In the early days of December 1941, American submariners and pilots of patrol flying boats Catalina continued to monitor the massive transfer of Japanese troops to areas of concentration on the islands of Formosa, Saipan, and Palau in the ports of South Indochina, as well as in the Gulf of Thailand. The transportation by sea of about 400,000 men, with a corresponding number of horses, equipment, weapons, and supplies, could not be concealed even in times that did not know reconnaissance satellites. At a large meeting at the White House on December 2nd, attended by U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt and key ministers. Roosevelt and key ministers, all present, agreed with the conclusions of intelligence. The Japanese Empire in the coming days will unleash hostilities in Southeast Asia. However, it remained unclear whether the American possessions in the region, the Philippines, as well as military bases on Guam and Wake Atoll, would be attacked or whether the Japanese would initially limit themselves to the British and Dutch colonies. It is worth recalling here that at that time, the United States was not bound to these countries by any alliance obligations. So in such a development, it would have had no legitimate reason to enter the conflict. Polls conducted the day before showed that although most Americans supported the administration's line of deterring Japanese aggression, few would have approved of US entry into World War II. The situation in Congress, which would have to approve such a decision, was no better. The only thing that could change public opinion in the direction Roosevelt's team wanted was a direct Japanese attack on American territory, or, at the very least, on American ships. It may seem particularly cynical to some to want to staff these low-value bait ships with equally low-value native crews, but in fact it was even more cynical this wish was dictated not at all by concern for the priceless lives of American sailors, but also by banal politics. An important land military force in the archipelago were the Philippine units under American command. Through the mobilization of the local population, their number was planned to increase to 120,000 people. Therefore, in order to ensure support from the local administration and population, it was desirable that the Filipinos on the ships under the Star-Spangled Banner should die at the hands of the treacherous Japanese. Executors. This order expectedly did not cause a burst of enthusiasm in the chief of the U.S. Asiatic Fleet, Admiral Hart, whose first reaction was the following answer. It is impossible to charter and prepare ships in two days. However, the order of the president is the order of the president, and the admiral had to engage in a classic search for internal reserves, which of course were found. But the only vessel, more or less matching the above criteria and ready for immediate departure, turned out to be a service steam yacht, the festive flagship of the commander-in-chief of the Asiatic fleet himself. It was a 710-ton twin-tube 1917-built PY-10 Isabel, which had participated in World War I, first as an auxiliary destroyer and then as a patrol vessel. Among other things, Isabel had not too conspicuous armament, two 76 Minor 50 guns, two 76 Minor 23 anti-aircraft guns, and a pair of 7.62 Minor Minor and Lewis machine guns. However, as Admiral Hart reported to the command, she has too small a range to accomplish anything, and since we have so reduced the number of fast ships, her loss would be sensitive. The yacht's Admiral's boat has been replaced by a more practical Vell boat, and additional life rafts. All standard Navy code books were left ashore, replaced by a simple list of conventional signals. The ship's commanding officer, Lieutenant Commander John Payne, was instructed to return fire and break for the Philippines in the event of an attack, but never to allow the ship to be surrendered. It was to be scuttled if threatened with capture. As instructed, the crew was replenished with five Filipinos, and on December 3, 1941, the bait ship left Manila Bay and set a course to the west in the direction of the main stronghold of the Japanese fleet in South Indochina, the port of Cam Ran. The trip was Zalinged by the search for the allegedly missing flying boat, Catalina. Fortunately, Isabel was not destined to repeat the fate of the American river gunboat PR-5 Penne, 
whether by mistake or because of the excess of good fortune sunk by Japanese deck bombers and fighters in China on the Yangtze River four years earlier. Two days after leaving the Philippines, the patrol vessel began her defense information mission 22 miles off the coast of Indochina. Isabel observed Japanese ships and vessels. But the Japanese, although they made several overflights of the yacht patrol seaplanes Aichi E-13A, it seems that they were not going to take the bait and attack the annoying American ship. So in the evening of December 6th, Isabel was ordered to return. Meanwhile, in the main base of the U.S. Asiatic fleet in Cavite, Manila Bay, was feverishly preparing two ships that already exactly meet the requirements of the order. The first was the 150-ton, 1914 built, two-masted schooner, Lanikai. It was equipped with a three-pounder 47mm gun, Gotchkis, modeled as early as 1885, 12.7-meter machine gun, Browning, and 7.62-meter Lewis. Already on December 5, 1941, the new patrol vessel was officially accepted into the U.S. Navy, or rather, returned to it, taking into account the patrol service during the First World War. The Lanikai's crew was recruited from Filipino volunteers, and Manila-born Latit Kapti. Kemp Tali was appointed commander. The order he received was to patrol the exit from Camron Bay and report the course of the Japanese fleet in the event of its exit. This order was especially piquant due to the faulty radio transmitter of the schooner. There was no time left for its repair. Another chartered schooner, Molly Moore, was not prepared and accepted into the fleet, so almost nothing is known about it. In the evening of December 7, 1941, the time of the Eastern Hemisphere, Lanakai went to the exit from Manila Bay where she anchored to wait for dawn. To pass mine barriers in the dark was too risky. But already at 0328 in the radio broadcast sounded the words known to all, air attack Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. In the distant main base of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, it was the morning of December 7 in the Western Hemisphere. The need for provocation was no longer necessary, and the Lanakai's campaign was canceled. One can only wonder whether the commander of the Isabelli Lieutenant Commander John Payne understood the true purpose of his strange campaign on the eve of the war. Probably not. At least, his colleague, the commander of the Lanakai, Lieutenant Commander Tolly, managed to serve, among other things, and the assistant naval attaché in Moscow, retired as a rear admiral and wrote three books. In his article devoted to this episode, writes that he did not understand the meaning of such a reconnaissance, especially considering that the command of the U.S. Asiatic fleet had at its disposal in abundance and more suitable for this task forces in means, submarines and patrol Catalina, which, unlike the Lanakai, had at least serviceable radios. Rear Admiral Edwin Layton, former head of the U.S. Pacific Fleet Intelligence Agency, directly asserted that the young officers were used in the dark. This was confirmed by Admiral Hart himself when, during one meeting, he introduced retired Rear Admiral Kemp Tolley as a young man I once had to send away on a one-way ticket. When asked directly, do you also believe that our mission was incident bait, a casus belli? Admiral Hart answered just as bluntly, yes, I believe it was bait, and I could cite evidence, but I won't and neither will you. It would be ridiculous to brand our anti-Hitler allies as warmongers in the Pacific. By the time Admiral Stark's order was sent, the aircraft carriers and escort ships of Daiichi Kido Butai, Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo's first mobile force, had already been en route to Pearl Harbor for six days. Ironically, they also received an important order that day. It was the famous Climb Mount Nitaka 1208 radiogram setting the date for the start of hostilities, December 8, 1941, December 7th in the Western Hemisphere. As it turned out, the Japanese did not need anyone's hints, provocations, or casus belli to unleash their long-planned war, out of habit, not caring about silly conventions like its formal declaration. Obviously, it was objectively favorable for the Soviet Union, too, to join the U.S. in World War II, 
at least for security reasons in the Soviet Far East, where the probability of a Japanese invasion was now reduced to almost zero. It should be remembered that big politics has never been done with white gloves, and the two small ships, despite their fate as sacrificial lambs, served safely in the Pacific until the very end of the war, bringing victory closer to them to the extent of their modest strength. PY-10 Isabel, once built as the personal yacht of automobile magnate John Willis, was engaged in patrolling, guiding through mine barriers and rescuing sailors from ships sunk by the Japanese. Together with the remnants of the Asiatic fleet, Isabel retreated to Java, from where, unlike many ships and vessels, ABDA managed to break through to Australia, where she continued to serve as part of the Southwest Pacific Submarine Force Command. The schooner Lanikai suffered a similar fate, with the only difference being that after breaking out of Java and undergoing repairs, she was transferred to the Australian Navy. Both ships were decommissioned in 1946, after which one was scrapped and the other sank during a typhoon. Thank you for watching the video to the end. Forget to put a like and subscribe to the channel. It's important to us. See you soon.